Um, going back to the climate data, um, I think we should take a look at the bulk of the data. Every single one of these um, data cells has, is a category of data that was collected. M remember, the rows are the hours of the year, and the columns are the different variables that were measured. Or these columns have headers. Um, and I've got here under TMY key the key to all those headers. And what you can do is copy row 8, if you're curious, and insert it above row 9. So highlight row 9, right click, and insert copied cells. And you'll see the header information for each of these. So date, 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 hour, minute, dry bulb temperature, dew point temperature. Some of these are quite long, and so if you look up here, you can see the full heading. You can also see the full heading by double-clicking on the right-hand uh, side of one of these columns. You could also select them all, like this, and double-click, and they'll all automatically size. So dew point, relative humidity, atmospheric pressure, horizontal radiation, direct normal radiation, etc., etc. I'm not going to go through every single one. But you can see there's a lot of data that's um, generated here and uh, is really useful. One thing to do is to scan the data and make sure that there's nothing, no bad data. You can see that this goes from 0 to 400 to 2800, etc. So this looks like good data. Um, if we go to the right here, you'll see that there's a few columns that probably have zeros in them. The present weather observation is all zeros. The weather codes are nonsense. The precipitation is all zeros. Um, the aerosol optical depth is all the same number. The snow depth actually looks like, in this case, it is collecting some data, which is unusual. I almost never see that. I don't know how, um, how reliable that data is. And then days since last snow, to, snow is also not, it's all 88s there. So um, it's important to check the, the veracity, the truthfulness of the data to make sure that you're, you're looking at things that are, are reasonable. So this looks good. Um, and now down here, there are, there's a week tab and a year tab. And I want to go through these. The week tab has a whole lot of data in it. And um, you can read the, the red text here. It says scroll right for graphs and check yellow highlighted cells to make sure they match the cell underneath. If not, you paste the TMY data incorrectly or there's a problem with your data. So what that's trying to say is this says dry bulb temperature and this says dry bulb temperature. They should say the same thing. If they say something different, there's something really wrong and you're not, you're not going to get good results. So relative humidity, global horizontal. I'm just going to check this real fast and make sure. Diffuse, total sky cover, wind direction, wind speed, and that's good. Now this one, this column here, for precipitation, it says, find a reliable source and enter precipitation by hand. As we just saw in the TMY data, the precipitation numbers are rarely correct in this. Um, and it can be misleading. So in this case, we see it's all zeros, meaning precipitation was never collected. And so you need to find a source yourself. Now, in this case, all I'd like you to do is collect, uh, find monthly data, which uh, should be easier to find. You can find this even on, like, TripAdvisor or something like that. Um, I will just, I'll show you a process that I um, go through, which is to just type in the name Stuttgart Monthly precipi Precipitation and... Average monthly rainfall, that looks good. Usually I try to look at two or three sources because the internet lies a lot. Um, be nice to have it in numbers, but if I just get a graph, that's okay. So here it is in millimeters. So I can uh, transcribe this into here by scrolling over. So January is about 
58 millimeters. February is about 55 millimeters. March is 50. April is 61. May is 80. June is 85. July is 70. August is 65. September is 56. October 59. November 62. December 65. And then January, um, this comes back again to January. That repeats there. There's, it's um, a formula that says copy that one again. So now I'm going to take a look at another website, US World Weather Online. Let's see if this is any better. And see if I get similar numbers. Precipitation. Oh, now they've got uh, actually got the numbers. That's helpful. So this looks like a very similar pattern. Don't forget to copy your source. So I'm going to copy this URL so I can find it later if I want. Um, source. I'm going to put it right in there, and that way I've got it for later. Okay. So that updates the precipitation. And if you want to check to see what that looks like, go to year. And at the bottom of this list, you'll see the precipitation graph. This should look similar to what we just looked at. That's what's populated. While we're on this sheet, let me uh, show you the rest of the graphs on the annual, the annual graphs here. So I'm going to go up to the top. And remember to always read this red text. It says to change the y-axis, right-click on the scale, select format axis, and enter the minimum minimax values. Number two, the temperature graph below is actually two graphs. The comfort zone is overlaid on top of the temperature graph. To change the temperature graph, you need to move the comfort graph. So what I'm talking about here is actually the second graph right here. This graph is two graphs overlaid on each other. I'll, I'll show you how this works. So if you click on uh, the first graph, you can press shift and move it over, you'll see that that is just the two comfort zones, the comfort band. Um, and there's no other way to do this, unfortunately, to overlay the comfort band on top of the data. So I've had to create this kind of workaround. So I'm going to um, actually, what I recommend you do is, is delete this, actually, and I'll show you why in a second. And um, if you want to change the vertical axis, because um, right now it's set to auto um, scale, I right click and go to format axis. And over here, I can change this. So right now the boundaries are set um, automatically to minus 20 to 40. I can come back here and make them a little bit smaller, minus 10 to say 35. Um, and see more of the data. It expands to fill the boundary. If I want to then uh, go back to auto, I can press reset and it will go back to the auto boundary. So I'm going to just show you how to do this. If you keep this at a, a fixed um, boundary, the y-axis, then what we need to do is, is remake that comfort zone that is running through here so it can um, then get overlaid on top. So to do this, press Control C, copy the entire graph, and I'm going to go right next to it and click Control V, and that will copy the entire graph. But I don't want the graph, I just want this little comfort band. So actually what I can do is erase, this is kind of fun, I'm selecting these things and pressing delete, and um, I can erase everything and have only these comfort bands left. Now, I think that one thing you're going to want to do is make sure that this stays fixed. So, because if I delete it, I don't know, that's good. All right, we're all good. Nothing bad happened. And the last thing is, notice this is a white background. I'm going to right click on that and say format plot area. And you see it says no fill, no line. Um, and you actually need to click here in the chart area. And it's set to be a solid fill. I'll just make this another color so you can see what I'm talking about. That background. So instead of a fill, I'm going to um, make this no fill. And it will turn transparent. And then I can press shift and drag this back so it's all lined up and then visually just align it the rest of the way. Hopefully that's clear.
Let me know if you have any questions about that process. And now that I've uh, got the dry bulb temperature and humidity in a place where I want it, I can look at these other graphs and make sure uh, they're good to go. Looks like these are just fine. So if you're happy with these, and you know it, clap your hands. No, just joking. Um, keep reading the red text. All graphs reference data on the week tab. Remember to manually enter the precipitation data. This one does not automatically update. Okay, we've done that. We're good. Number four, after you set up the graphs, print the page to PDF. Depending on the speed of your computer, this could take two to ten minutes. It's a lot of data. Be patient. So um, I can go ahead and press File, Print, and again, you have to be a little bit patient. My computer is probably not as good as your computer's. Uh, but you see, it, it comes up with a page here, and as long as this is set to print active page, it will just show the page that you're currently on. And you can, this is set to be tabloid, you can print this, and it will print a PDF. I'm going to just save this to my desktop right now, and... And here's the sheet. So this is the PDF. Now one thing, uh, InDesign does not particularly like PDFs that have a lot of vectors on them like this one does. So what I recommend you do is save this now as a PNG file. To do that, this is pretty easy. You go to File, uh, Export To, and you want to export this to an image, a PNG. So I'll leave this on here for a second so you can see it. Export to image, PNG. And under settings, just make sure that your settings are um, set to, set like this. A no grayscale, embedded RGB profile, and this should be good. So I'm going to save this as a PNG. And now I can import that into InDesign, and it should import really nicely. You'll reduce the overall uh, uh, file size. It'll be easier to work with.